Um, great. Well, welcome everybody. It's a couple after and we'll get going. Um, like I said, super grateful for, uh, for everyone being on the call today and, and really excited. Last week's call was so great to kind of hear from the, hear from the demand side, the organizations out there doing, you know, what they're doing with, um, with COVID and, and trying to think about, you know, ways to, to work in, in, in new, new ways. Today, we've got a great program, some really great, you know, thinkers to talk about what they're thinking about, what they're doing. Um, so, but let's get started with, uh, with Chris Stanton again. Chris, you know, are you on? Yeah, I'm right here, John. Great. Yeah, I, so I, I was super impressed. One of the things I love about, you know, working with Chris is that, you know, sometimes, as, as we all know, you know, academic stuff is, it takes a long time to do. But, you know, Chris last week talked about um, this, this survey that he did. And then, lo and behold, we were talking yesterday. And there it was as an academic paper. So way to rock it, man. It was, it was really cool to see some fast turns and some deep understanding. So I'd love for you just to chat about kind of, you know, and, and everybody today is kind of now that, you know, it feels like the COVID, you know, COVID curve is starting to just starting to flatten in several places. How do you see companies emerging from this and, and how, how will we all move, move forward? Like, will there be a new paradigm for work or will we just slide back into work as usual? So why don't you take it away, Chris? Yeah. Uh, John and I had a very interesting call yesterday. And one of the things that we were discussing is whether we thought a paradigm shift toward remote was going to be something that was more permanent. And I don't know the answer to that. It's something that I'm actively try trying to pursue, but I'll give you uh, one data point, which I think is telling. Uh, and that is uh, software engineers are able to work anywhere, 28.5% of them work in five commuting zones in the US, meaning that almost a third of all software engineers in this country are working out of five places. And as a result, I think that one of the things that many of you have struggled with uh, in transforming organizations, et cetera, is this notion that we need to be together to collaborate effectively. And we see some of the highest paid individuals uh, in, in the economy who have largely co-located. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see if this shock uh, from COVID that has now caused everyone to move to working remotely and to using remote collaboration will lead to persistent changes in, in that respect. One of the, the debates around this, and I've been talking to a bunch of people uh, about this, starting with that fact, is that many folks see single source either supply chains or single source offices now as an enormous risk, especially if you think about second wave effects or the shutdown of trade between places. And so I would at least put a little bit of probability weight on the view that we will see more dispersion in locations over the long run. I would also, I think as, as a second sort of source, think that because we've seen such enormous uh, implications for layoffs, furloughs, or the like, that we, we may see a model that looks more of a hybrid model between traditional employment and more uh, open work between gigs, contests, uh, you name it, as part of the, the recovery process. So my uh, final thought is that this is just a fascinating time to be in this space. I think that if you had asked me six months ago if we would all be collaborating on, on Zoom four or five hours a day, uh, my answer would certainly have been no. And now here we are, and uh, my suspicion is that some of us are even more productive than what we were in the office. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But I, I think this is just a fascinating time to be here to observe what, what everyone's doing. Great. Thanks, Chris. And just as a reminder, Chris is the, the Marvin Bauer Associate Professor of Business Administration at, at uh, Harvard Business School in the Entrepreneurial Management Unit. So if you want to connect with him, just, you know, put, put uh, you know, 
put it up in the chat. He'll, I'm sure he'll, he'll connect with so. So thanks, Chris. Really appreciate that. I kind of want to dive in a little, uh, a little bit deeper. Um, Steve Hatfield, you're the, you're here today, right? Are you here, Steve? Can you hear me? I'm here. Yeah. Hey, so Steve Hatfield, who's the the global director of future of work at Deloitte, is here. And uh, you know, Steve and I met each other at the Upwork event. I guess it was in July, right, Steve? Yeah. I was, you know, it was, yeah, it was the second day of the, the it was the second day of the meeting, and I, Steve, you know, your presentation on kind of this global view of of the future of work in the context of some of the research you guys have been doing at Deloitte just really blew my mind, and I, I'm I'm really fascinated to hear kind of from your perspective how you see us emerging from this crisis, and you know, I mean, obviously it's early, and we're just seeing signs of a turnaround, but you know, just kind of based on all the research that you guys have done, I guess over 11 years, the research projects been going on. Um. And it, well, how the do you see is coming out was coming out this month, but has now been delayed a couple months because we, um, because of the dynamic. So, but, um, yeah, so, so go for it. We'd love to hear kind of what you're thinking and, and how you're how you see it rolling out. Yeah, absolutely. So, so everyone, I'm delighted to be here, John. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, just we, we we've been saying amongst my team, the future of work is now. Um, all of the trend lines that we had been talking about we started to sense through our trends report back in 16 and then 17. I think I wrote the first piece on man and machine in one of the reports back in 2016. Um, have, have, have really been thrust into the, the forefront at this point. Um, they, all, they all are, in a sense, the, the dynamics that now everyone has been forced into stepping into. So as, as we've been start, starting to think about it, there's a, we're seeing sort of three phases to this. The first was respond, just get things sorted out, get cloud out there to everybody, get everybody computers as best you can. And if there are organizations that had some degree of working from home policies or a certain amount of virtual work happening in the organization or had thought about how to help their workforce be more productive virtually, they were able to pretty rapidly get things up and running. I have a couple stories that, that, that have filtered my way. One of my favorite is a, a, a large banking operation in China um, had been putting in place some, some work from home policies, more out of worker preferences, more out of, more out of you know, the, the level of perk and, intra, and, and that, not, not with much more to it than that. But because of that, it's a 12,000 person operation. The minute it hit, they were able to ensure that everybody had work from home capabilities. They just got that to everybody and they've kept up an 80% response rate in their op center through the whole course of this. And so, so those that had some of that in place were, are now demonstrating a certain amount of resilience. And, though, and, and, and those that did not, did not are, you know, are, are experiencing, um, you know, it's, it's been a bumpy ride, let's just call it that. And the stories are coming through about you know, I forgive the sector insurance companies where, you know, team leaders are asking people every day, like, what are you doing today? Send me a list. And at the end of the day, they check in, okay, what did you do today? Send me a list. And, and so that comfort level with how to manage a team virtually, how to scale your organization virtually, how to operate on digital platforms is, is, is less mature. And, um, and that's, you know, part of what's starting to emerge. And so, as we think about the next phase, which is moving into recovery, and then potentially moving into what the new normal will be, thriving in that new normal, um, we're, we're suggesting that organizations need to think really hard about, um, one, how they're engendering trust with their workforce, their partners, their, their, their other employees, their other um, alternative workers, and in, in, in very simple ways, in terms of the, the moves that they've made around financial security, the moves that they've made around emotional well-being, the moves that they've made around um, how team leaders are being coached to check in with people and, and help people through this process, through this pandemic. The psychological toll is, is, is an important thing to remember and to keep in mind. And, it, and so many of the wellness things that people are talking about actually come to life in helping, helping people deal with that toll. Many of the 
very tactical tips and techniques on how to work virtually, setting up times where you're working synchronously versus asynchronously, setting meeting agendas, things like that, help uh, a worker deal with his or her home life, and you know the, the challenges people have when they're anxious around focus. So loss of focus, lack of sleep, depression, these are the issues that we anticipate um, people having to grapple with, just given the anxiety of what's going on and the, 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 the toll from isolation. Um, so the trust dynamic becomes very important. And then, then there's also this dynamic around, well, what work actually can be done productively virtually? And what work might not be able to be so? And if we have to then be physical in some fashion, can you reimagine work in a way that still creates the opportunity for more digital activities to happen and or for workers to gain the safety that they need to continue to be in a physical place. And so a, 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 an example that came to us from an auto, automotive manufacturer is that they had a group of people on a production line, you know, in a, in a factory who were there to fix the production line when it went down. And so that team of people would get word that such and such a, you know, line is down, they, they'd migrate over as a group, the team would look at the, at, at the production line, they'd start tinkering with it, figuring it out, and as a team, they decide what to do. And in the course of this, they rethought that. So now, thanks to IoT, you know, an alert can happen. The team can all get the alert from wherever they are. They can get on a conference call or on a virtual platform. They can discuss it. And one person who's close can maintain appropriate social distancing and, and be the person who's on the ground trying to fix it. And so that reimagination example, I think, is going to become more and more the story in the coming, say, coming weeks and months. Because it is possible to be productive virtually, but you need to have the right toolkits in the right platforms and you need to understand how to use them correctly in order for that to happen. Um, I think part of what Chris was saying that I found really interesting was that um, you know, there are some data sets around productivity from working from home that were, that, the, and performance that were, that were in play before COVID. Um, things to the effect of like 77% of the workers surveyed in a particular study felt they were more productive at home. 31% felt that they were, they got more done in less time. And uh, other tangential benefits, organizations with work from home policies had, were three times more likely to have women leaders, women in leadership positions. And, and so it is possible to be productive. I just think that many organizations have yet to fully adapt to what that what that could be like. And Chris, the network effects you were talking about, right? So this, the, the software engineers are in certain locations because you know, they, they all you know, play off each other, meet in bars and things like that, um, and you know, get different jobs in, in those industries that cluster in those, those, those economic networks. Like that, that, that clearly is gonna change, right? I, the, the, the ability for you now to work anywhere. I mean, to what extent will, that coupled with preferences that the generations have around different climate issues will will enable people to start working from more beautiful rural locations. I myself am living in the Berkshires, so I'm a, um, a little in Massachusetts, so I'm a little guilty of that on my own. Um, so, so I think those will, will push uh, push forward. And so, as as organizations grapple with the reimagination, as they grapple with the trust dimension. And as they start to think about planning for the return to work, and we're already getting questions about that. And at first blush, you think to yourself, it's a little premature. Like, you know, the, the, even the Times just, it was yesterday that said five factors have to be true for us to be able to come, start coming back. One of which is, you know, hospitals are in good stead and can handle it. Another is there's, you know, um, um, a, a vaccine. The third is that you can actually track and monitor people who have COVID and sort of understand that social tracking. Um, so, so part of what, um, sorry everyone. Um, excuse me. So part of what, um, uh, they're asking is how do we stage the return to work? And part of the conversation starts going down the path of, well, who do you actually have to have back in the shop working physically together in what way and how? And 
you might decide that a product innovation group needs to be together a certain amount of time because that's how they're used to producing innovation together. And perhaps some of that is true. And then you might decide that your finance function, actually, they don't like to work virtually, but they can. They can be very productive that way. That work can, can be productive. And so there's a, there's a set of scenario planning that needs to happen, modeling on who comes back when and in which order. And, and, and how do we reset the workplace so it creates the psychological safety that people need given the nature of the dynamic? Uh, social distancing, sanitation, signs on conference rooms, whatever it might be. And, and then how do we help those parts of the shop that we need to stay virtual be more productive that way? And so that next normal, you know, Gartner just put out a study, 74% of the CFOs believe that people will not come back. It will be a very different um, sort of balance of virtual workers and, and those that are on your balance sheet physically. And the minute you go there, it starts to hit the notes on the gig economy and the alternative workforce. Because that level of ability to kind of plug in digital workers and the fact that you're doing it already. And so just create the right firewalls and just create the, curate the right gig workforce, connect them into your teams in the way that you need, create the level of flexibility that that offers you organizationally. All of that was early days, I would say, in many organizations who were just beginning to sort of think, mm, maybe I should consider this. And now we're watching, you know, um, stories abound where um, those workers are being seen and highly prized because they actually know how to work virtually. That's how they're set up. So anyway, that, that was, those are just a few of the observations. I, a bit of a whistle stop tour. Let me, um, let me pause and turn it back to John. Yeah, that's really great, Steve. I, I would encourage you. So when, when is your report coming out in a couple months? So our 2020 trends, which shows longitudinally how we've mapped and seen sort of some of these things emerging um, is, is complete. It's soft launch now, but we're gonna, we're gonna hard launch it in May. Um, and in it, we sort of address not just all the trends, but sort of the dialogue that says that organizations need to really think in terms of thrive around um, purpose, potential, and perspective. And what we mean by that is, um, the, the broad dialogue on purpose and people feeling connected to work and work being meaningful. Potential meaning the, the ability to help people achieve greatness in their own way, given the dynamic. And perspective is just helping everybody stay connected um, to sort of the new direction of things, the new missions that your organization will take on, the, the shifts that will now happen in terms of serving customers and things like that. That's great, Steve. Well, could you could you share a link with this? I know I got a link for the last study when it, when I was at the Upwork conference, and absolutely, it's been, it's been always you know at my it, on my desk kind of a good reference. So um, it'd be awesome if we could all get that and we'll share it a, a, a much amongst the group. Thanks a lot for for kicking things off today and and kind of you know contrasting things and, and building on what what Chris had to say as well. Um, hey, Biology, are you on the line? You and I have been having some really interesting dialogues about some some of the stuff you're doing lately. Um, and Balaji is also from Deloitte, but I would love to kind of have you talk to the group a little bit about what on the ground, some of the things you've got going on. Yeah, and I think, um, Steve, well, you and I catch up often enough that macro view was very useful. I'm sure you know, once, I, once I get done, if anybody else on the call has questions for you, I think it'd be a, it'd be a good time to just pick your brains on, uh, on so many things that you're in the middle of. Um, at, the, at the micro level that I'm, I'm focused on, you know, uh, what, what, I, what we see right now happening is there are, there are lots of exchanges that are being built where companies that are, being, uh, that are following or laying off people want to connect those laid off employees to other companies that are hiring. Um, so the, the economy is, is moving really fast in some places and it's slowing down significantly in other places. So there are informal economies and exchanges that are being created where companies in, the, in, in, in transportation or in hotels are connecting with companies, in, in companies like CVS and others and Amazon and Instacart that are hiring very rapidly. Um, but what's happening is it, you, you do that when you know and recognize that these people might not come back ever because this is a full-time exchange that has happened. Where I'm focused on more is um, for headquarter employees, corporate employees, white collar employees, where the company actually wants them back, wants to keep them, once the situation stabilizes, I want to continue working with them. They are, they, they are looking for how can I connect them with short term to medium term opportunities. 
and the best aggregators of short term and medium term opportunities are all the marketplaces and and some of them might be on the call um, might be on the call here so at least my goal in the last couple of uh, couple of weeks is to try and work with as many employers as we can to connect them to these marketplaces so that um, any forward employees have the choice to go and work with um, uh, have to have a choice to go put their profiles on any of these marketplaces depending on the function or their skill set um, and then have an in, have a connection with the have the large company have a connection with the marketplace so that there's a there's at least a, a little bit of additional attention provided to these people as a way of relation relationship building um, and we started this effort about two weeks back to connect uh, many marketplaces with uh, with a small list of clients that is growing and I, I must say I have been humbled by the reaction from all the marketplaces that were extremely eager to do the right things and I'm, I'm sure some of you are on this call from TopTal, Upwork, Paro, Communo, Topcoder, Xprofi, BTG, VR, Rosie, like these are just a few companies that I that I spoke to in the last couple of weeks and every one of them um, was very eager to to help the people agnostic of the fact that they're coming from an employer find uh, new opportunities and also and I, and I think um, to what Steve said um, this is this is a great way in which for these freelance marketplaces to educate the large companies about what is that short term medium term workforce and dispel a lot of myths about what is gig economy and you know many times when I introduce these marketplaces to the clients they're like you can get an, an average of a hundred to two hundred dollars per hour and they're like that is not what I expected to hear about freelancing. Um, so there's a lot of education that's happening in the right moment with the right type of message, uh, and, I, and, I, and I hope to connect as many clients as we we need to to these marketplaces so that um, you know this this type floats uh, all boats. And I think it it um, it and only then only when these new relationships and these new connections are fostered will we actually have a new normal. Otherwise, we'll revert back to the traditional mean. And I think our, and I've been impressed with all of the marketplaces who understand that uh, that long-term vision and are helping very actively. So I just want to thank everybody, uh, at least any any of the team members or from the marketplaces on the call, to say there's a lot more work to do. But I think you've shown the right attitude at this time. Thank you. That's great, Paul. You know, I really appreciate that build and kind of getting the you know 30,000 foot view from Steve and then really dr drilling down into some examples of what's happening on the ground. I do, you know, in all the conversations I've had, I'm really amazed and, and appreciative of everybody's willingness to lean in and help each other and not just, you know, not just on the demand side, but the supply side and really build this momentum together. Because I do think this is a, you know, this is a tipping point to the future as Steve talked about. Hey, Steve Rader, I, I know you've been listening and shooting some notes on the side. I'd love to get your kind of reaction on things. And you and I talked earlier this week about, you know, what's happening at NASA and the federal government and and maybe build upon what Steve and and, and Balaji talked about, or even even questions you might have. Well, I, I actually I just posted one that I'm really curious and get Steve uh, you to to weigh in on it because you you mentioned you know that companies are going to have to really take care of employees as they come back, and with the kind of new construct of uh, marketplace, you know, open talent pools uh, where we're talking about there's going to be a whole lot more going on and there has been uh, that migration versus kind of in place workforce who whose responsibility is it to take care of those and do some of these intermediaries uh, and some of these marketplace platforms actually start to take on more and more of the we've got to take care of these these folks in in the ways that a traditional would have done right or do the client companies bear some responsibility to somehow care for uh, the contingent workforce in ways that they probably aren't used to, that they only would reserve for their full time? Kind of curious your read on that. It's a great question. Um, so I think I think I think given the nature of how people how organizations deal with the with the respond and recover phase will enable what happens for them and thrive. And it, people will remember what Marriott did, right? People will remember the way in which uh, Morgan Stanley and others have stepped up and said, everyone's gonna have a job for the next year, let's not worry about that, right? And 
but but at, it's now going to move into given just the dynamics of the virus into into a dimension of other ways in which you're expected to to create that level of trust and so i think it's going to be both right um and if you want an alternative workforce to work with you and for you then you need to also demonstrate that you, you're concerned about them, that you're caring for them. And they need to trust you because some of them might be coming to do physical work, Amazon Flex, whatever it might be. And they need to know that they're gonna be safe, right? And some of them need, some of them are coming to do virtual work and they need to know that they have cybersecurity or whatever it might also be in that respect. So, so I think it, 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 it becomes a matter of both players stepping into doing things to care for workers and creating that trust. Are there any of the platforms that want to weigh in on like, what are the ways that you're starting? Because I mean, that's the big barrier, right? To the contingent workforce really taking off is their, their feeling of security that this construct actually works. And so I'm kind of curious, I don't know, Dean or one of you guys uh, talking about like, what are you doing? Like, how are you dealing with your workforce that that you, you know, you, you can't guarantee them a job, but you know, what, what are there? Are you, is it training? Is it, you know, what are, what are ways that you're dealing with that? Just out of curiosity. I like to put Dean on the spot because he's yeah, you named me. Setup, I have to I like say to something now. <laughs> um, I mean, fundamentally at the simplest, I mean, our business has always run that way in the sense that, you know, our goal is to keep a high utilization rate in our platform. We're somewhere between 60 and 70 percent is, is, is what we call utilization. It's, you can't use the same math as a consultancy, right, uh, around utilization because our denominator is, um, comes and goes. But the point of the story there is it's, it's a high utilization, uh, probably at least six to up to 15 times higher than any other given platform, mostly because the supply and demand is controlled uh, to be kind of matching. And so your average talent has a different um, perspective on engagement with us, is kept mostly busy. Of course, there's a tail there where there, there are folks who um, are engaged less so. And you know, as, as economics are in, impact our business, which you know they are slowly, you know, utilization drops, so then what do you do? Um, I mean, the easiest thing for us, just, just like any major consultancy is, right, stop um, uh, accepting new folks into our network. Uh, I mean, we turn, you know, 98, 99% of the people away from uh, joining our network, and so you just shut the door. Um, attrition helps the supply demand, you know, kind of match a little bit more. Those who have been in the network longer, you know, tend to get more work. Um, so those things just kind of happen organically. We're keeping an eye right now. I mean, we had, we had, you know, about three months more demand than we had supply, um, friend EA there, uh, between everyone on the phone. And, uh, and so there's a backlog that we're just burning down. Uh, so we know when people are coming off projects, again, similar to consulting world, and we know how to restaff them. And we're just doing a really good job at that to keep holes out of people's schedules, uh, which isn't fun because you don't get paid when there's a hole. Um, I think that's, you know, we're going to operate that way for a quarter here. Um, you know, economically, if things get worse. Um, yeah, I mean, we may pivot to um, taking advantage of our partnerships with Amazon, uh, Google, so AWS and GCP clouds uh, we have a good partnership where they have offered uh, training sessions then they're pivoting to remote uh, believe it or not <laughs> Amazon <clears throat> is there anyone from Amazon on <laughs> they're uh, they tend to not be a, a remote friendly company uh, which is just crazy um, because of the cloud and uh, they've uh, had a hard time pivoting to giving these classes uh, that our talent are available to attend uh, remotely. So they're pivoting. Uh, and so we're making a lot more of those available and taking downtime when we can. So we, we between Amazon and, and TopTel, we offset costs of that stuff. Um, you know, that's, that's something to do. It's not money in your pocket, Steve. Uh, but those are the kinds of things we're initially trying to do here. Um, we don't have any other such formal, you know, package or anything like that, that, that we're putting in place that I'm aware of at least. Um, yeah, 
I mean, those are, those are the kind of things we're doing and, and that's more of a supply demand situation. I don't know if that answers your question, Steve. Yeah, great Dean, that's awesome. Thanks. Anybody else from the platform? Any, anybody else from the platform side? Yeah, Sheila, I see you out there. Uh, you're, you're on mute. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. So this is my first time here. Thank you very much. I had not joined an open assembly meeting or call before, but uh, this topic is so provocative, I can't help but jump in. Um, so LifeSciHub is an online resource marketplace for uh, independent consultants in the life sciences R&D niche. I myself am an independent consultant. I'm a regulatory and clinical operations consultant. I'm the founder of this platform, so I, I know this niche really well. And you had only given two choices to that, that question, which was who's going to take care of these people? Is it going to be the platform or is it uh, going to be the employer? I think were the two questions or the two answers. And in our niche, the consultants themselves are responsible for themselves. They're not expecting to be uh, held safe by the marketplace. The marketplace is just another tool to help them on their journey, which is they're on the front lines of their own revenue generation. They're not looking for that revenue generation to come from some parent organization. They're just looking for tools. So I, I just wanted to throw in that there is a third option in that, in that original equation, at least uh, in our niche. Yeah, I love that. I think that's a great point of view. I mean, for me personally, as a, as a you know, entrepreneur over a lot of time, I've always, looked at a lot of the movements that's happening in the, in the freelance and open talent world is, you know, there's a bit of micro entrepreneurism happening too, right? As the cost of technology comes down, people being able to establish businesses in a new way with a lot fewer people, sometimes just themselves. So can so, I just say one, uh, yeah, can I just say one other thing. My background here is deliberately whimsical. I had chatted earlier just to let everybody know in my niche, remote work is so incredibly common that we at this point as a culture, we're trying to shake up our backgrounds. And I just got off a Zoom call that was full of, you know, medical writers and biostatisticians, and we were competing about the interest in our backgrounds. So I just want to let everybody know, you heard it first, you're going to see that in your niche niches, I would guess in about two weeks. That's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, hey, Diane, you're always, you know, I see you really active on the on the uh, chat as well. And you always have such a great perspective on things. Any any thoughts, comments, questions? Are you there, Diane? I thought I saw you just a second ago. Oh, maybe she had to hop off. Okay. Um, let's move on. Is uh, is John Healy on from Kelly? You always I saw you post some really interesting things up in the in the chat as well, and would love to get your perspective and and maybe if you have any questions. Sure, Steve. I, I think um, it, it, what's fascinating us, John, right now is um, organizations' willingness to break rules. So we, we, we're, we're kind of on a, this little pathway of collecting all the rule breakers and, and acknowledging them and rewarding and recognizing, whether it's the, the work from home policies that that were on the shelf for two years trying to get deployed that suddenly got deployed in a week or it's the gig policies or for us, we're dealing with a lot on co-employment um, and the policies around um, how you communicate with or information that you share with the external workforce um, that's being thrown out because of safety issues um, that are out there, um, wages. Um, you know, we, we, we're still seeing companies, you know, I think for a lot on this line, we hear a lot of the platforms when we start thinking a lot of the stuff that is being done from home, but there's still a lot of work that is going on. You know, we talk about healthcare workers that are in the space, but there are manufacturing and production workers that are still inside environments and operating today. And, and you're getting a chance to look and see which companies, you know, are using the, 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 the thermometer to check everyone as they come inside the building who are demonstrating that they're um, cleaning the facilities every day and dealing with safety and, and what's your brand? How are you going to be remembered coming out of that? Um, and the number of companies that still want to pay wages that are below what you would earn by being on unemployment and receiving the federal subsidies that are out there right now is disgusting. 
It's absolutely reprehensible. And I think it is going to lead to a lot of questions for the organizations going forward. So what I guess I enjoy in, in these conversations each week and, and look forward to continue hearing is where all the rules are being broken, how we're using technology in different ways than what people bought it for originally and are now finding that it's fitting in. Um, and then as well, what rules are more important than ever? You know, I, I was one who whined a lot about our internal IT organization being more focused on uh, security and infrastructure than they were on, on, on cool things. And I tell you what, I'm, I'm quite appreciative to our CIO right now for the, the seamlessness that our entire organization has been able to become fully remote um, as an organization. And, and so we're, we're proud of those things. But I also think there's an aspect about the laws that we're gonna have to really challenge. You know, I'm, I'm, I saw Holly Heikinen uh, from iWorkers on the line. I was happy to see that, that the idea that we've got gig workers being covered for the first time, that's pretty freaking cool. Uh, now, our states have no idea how to deal with it right now. They have no idea what to do with the applications that are coming in. But the fact that that dialogue has been moving forward, that stuff is just, it's really important. So I go back repeatedly to, uh, it's, it's um, uh, Andrew McAfee and the team that wrote Machine Platform Crowd. And they talk about how in the second industrial revolution, you know, everyone thought when that steam engine was, was shut down and I put that electric motor in, everything was gonna happen. And excellent, Diane, love seeing it. Um, you know, were the, the first companies that deployed electricity did nothing, it was lipstick on a pig. It wasn't until Henry Ford and some others said, I'm really gonna change things. I'm gonna pause and think about how I can distribute work differently and do things differently. That's the opportunity to me that this crisis is forcing is, yeah, we're breaking all the rules and we're trying all kinds of different ways, but where are we gonna learn and where are we gonna see those exponential points of growth? And we've just gotta keep will being willing to share those stories as they come out. So. Yeah, I, I think to, to your question, John, what's the question to ask? It's what rules are you guys breaking that are causing your organization to find exponential growth? And, and what are the stories that we're all willing to share with one another? I love that. I think that might be a really good topic for the next meeting. Like, what, you know, let's talk about like what rules are being broken inside your organizations and, and how you see that, how you see that happen. Thanks, John. That's great. So hey, Diane, John. so. Hey, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just yeah. going to plus one to John. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a forum of people talking about, you know, new ways of getting talent out there. And right. And one of the, one of the challenges we always have, uh, you know, working with the staffing industry, to be frank, is working in a way in which uh, we work, change the rules, which, you know, were put in place um, between the client and, and an MSP, for example, and those rules are in place for a reason. And is there a reason to change the rules? Um, you know, that is, that is effectively the game that, you know, my organization played for some time. And I plus one to, to John on that is, uh, John Healy is, yeah, we're having these conversations, people are like, well, okay, I guess, I guess we can now talk about this. And, you know, I guess what you were saying wasn't that crazy Dean. <laughs> and so it's, it's been fun though. And, and, you know, and, and, uh, in conjunction with, um, our MSP partners to have those conversations and it actually is happening. No results, not yet. Right. But uh, those conversations are happening at a rapid pace. I think SIA put a article out yesterday, staffing industry analysts indicating that uh, I guess the level of conversation or communications between, you know, organizations like Kelly and their clients is significantly increased. And I suppose those are the conversations you're talking about, John. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, that's great. Ad. Dean, thanks a lot. Cool. Hey, Diane, I'll, I'll call on you again because I think there was a technical snafu, so, so take it away. All right. Thanks, John. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, fascinating conversation, um, both online and in the chat. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to see um, the, the waves of models um, that will be propagated as a result of this event. I really think that um, actually analysts should be asking different questions of the companies that they cover um, and should be um, really kind of prodding organizations regarding why they're not breaking kind of 
traditional norms and, and investing in these new models. Um, we, we need to get to, I think, the analysts, and we need to start to influence the, the metrics by which executives are, um, are evaluated, right? The COOs, the, the CEOs, um, we should be seeing and seeding new models um, and new, new sets of questions and, um, and kind of feeding new assumptions into the, the conversation about organizational performance. We, I think we need to get to that investor level, that analyst level to start to propagate from the top down, um, kind of why, why people aren't breaking with these, these old norms, these inefficient and, and kind of rigid regimented norms. Great, Talia, and that's great. Any, Steve, or anybody want to kind of jump in on that? Any points of view? My favorite, I mean, you got me going, Mr. Raider. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, it's all good. You, you mentioned my name. Good, just got yeah, it's always good. What was that? Was that Sheila, Sheila by the way? Uh, I like your whimsical background, but I have a live Pilates class going on behind me being broadcast to 100 people. So I, I think I got to win that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really interesting. We thought it was your housekeeper, Dean. Oh wow! I don't somebody think pops up behind you. Say, <laughs> Dean, <laughs> somebody I, cleaning I something get, behind you. <laughs> Dean, I get help from myself. <laughs> exactly. Oh, nice. Yeah, she's uh, she's been able to convert. Uh, that's my partner Heather. She's been able to convert ninety percent of her clients to uh, remote, and then actually gain a net twenty percent who apparently previously wasn't going to go to do Pilates in a gym, but now is willing to. It's just been the weird dynamic. Anyhow, sorry for that distraction. That's awesome. Um, uh, what were we? Oh, uh, I've been keeping track. I've just about did the LinkedIn piece on this. Like, so why aren't you, the question was that kind of like, why aren't things changing, right? Um, the, I've been counting the, the key reasons. I mean, there's, there's like, hey, I, I don't have a VPN. I'm not allowed to, disallowed, stuff like that. Um, the, the, we just talked about kind of the, the staffing program. Like if, if your hiring manager is going through a proper program as opposed to, you know, going around or doing, you know, like SOW consulting stuff, you know, the program rules, you know, you can almost blame that as a hiring manager if, if you're disallowed per, perhaps to use remote talent. But, um, but a lot of that stuff kind of goes away. You don't hear that as much. But what I am hearing now, um, it's interesting, HBS and like New York Times and all these other places is like, the conversation, and it's a rich conversation around uh, how do you know someone's productive at home? And I can't, I can't, like you never want to put me on an interview where someone asks that question because I, I just go ballistic because, you know, my response is like, well, how do you do that when they're in the office? And then usually the, the person asking the question is kind of dumbfounded because the only answer is I, I see them, therefore they're working. But that is my favorite uh, current du jour reason for not agreeing this is a sustainable thing. We are all suddenly remote, as it were. We wouldn't have rather been that way, but the question is, does this have an indelible fingerprint <clears throat> on the future? Um, and that's the key reason why no, it won't, and that I've been hearing is, I can't tell if people are productive, or it's really, it's really converted into, I don't know how to measure people's productivity in general, <laughs> Therefore, I can't certainly measure them when they're remote. I mean, that's kind of my cynical way of saying that, but I'll, I'll shut up there. Yeah, and I think, I, I think that uh, I see two different types of companies right now, right? One is a, the set of companies that are completely struggling because consumption has moved away from them. Travel, hospitality, leisure, um, retail, they've moved away. Just work or consumption has just moved away from them. What rules are they breaking to maintain um, maintain continuity? Just just keep business going. It's an it's an interesting question, and actually, I haven't thought about it as much. I think it's a, it's a good thing to think about. And the second type of companies are companies that are overwhelmed with consumption. Companies like CVS, Amazon, Instacart that are uh, even um, you know even um, everybody has to get a laptop. All of our electronics companies are all um, Zoom is all. Um, I think there's a there are there's potential to break rules in both of these buckets, but there are fundamentally different rules that need to be broken when you're when you are getting millions of resumes to say I am available and willing to be hired. Will you will those companies stay with the current uh, current talent model because it's working for them, or will they say with even even in the scale up model there are rules to be broken so that um, so that when 
the opposite happens that consumption decreases on this side we now have we can now scale down pretty pretty well without having to do our own layoffs when things stabilize um, and I think it's a, it's a great conversation to reflect on what do companies do that are that are uh, that are struggling in terms of consumption and other companies that are doing that are overwhelmed and there's a there's a good answer for either I think it's just good to think through but John I think Healy at least yeah, that's, that's a great right. question to ask saying what are the rules that are being broken if they are in if there aren't enough rules that are being broken then return to normal is the easiest option yeah i love that that sounds good maybe maybe for the next next week we should all think kind of contemplate on rules we're seeing that are being broken and 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 we should kind of come up with two categories right what are the rules that are most intriguing that are being broken but what are the rule what are the rules that should be broken that people aren't aren't willing to do some of the things that that dean mentioned Hey, I, I got a note here in the chat from, from Chuck. He wanted to add something, uh, Chuck Hamilton. So Chuck, take it away for a second. Thanks, John. I, I was just gonna say, if you wanted to look at a, organizations and or individuals who have broken the rules in the last eight weeks more than anybody I've ever seen, look at doctors and medical practitioners who've had to go virtual almost overnight in a lot of ways. They had to break every rule, every law in some cases about how they bill, I've been curating tools in this field for a number of groups I work with uh, in Spain and Portugal right now because they want to see what virtual doc tools we're using in Canada. And uh, it's an enormous shift. And I, you know, the fact that people were getting up every morning and going somewhere to get everybody sick at the same time doesn't make a lot of sense to anyone. But now that's going to be really clear that nobody should get up in the morning and go there and there should be a virtual doc option as fundamental at every clinic as it should be. And uh, it's really taking hold overnight, but they, um, their billing systems, everything they work on and every way they're measured is broke. They've had to break it in order to work. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I would like to add too that, you know, I've got four teenagers in, in uh, essentially four different schools and it's amazing to see the adapt, you know, adaptation of teachers and classes. You know, my son starts every every morning with the kind of his yoga class and then which is virtual and then right into his math class and people are using different tools and lots of flexibility and you know it's it's amazing the ad adaptation especially in a space where you think that you know public schools are are pretty slow to adapt to new things. So it's cool to see. But um, hey I, I think is Perry on because Perry from uh, Unilever. I was talking to her right before the the call, and she had some really good points that you know the things that she's thinking about and doing at Unilever. Um, I, but I wasn't sure if she was able to to make the call or not. If not, I'm I'm going to connect her with some of the folks that talked today because we had this, a lot of these same conversations this morning, and I know she wanted to be a part of it. She had a she had a meeting. Hey, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'd love for just people to kind of do some sharing and, you know, what, who's got any news, what they're thinking about. Um, and I know, Christian, you shot me a note, and I'd love for you to kind of share, you know, what's, what you're thinking about at HeroX and maybe other, how other people can help that effort or be involved in the effort. Sure, sounds good. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I just wanted to do a shout out that we've launched a COVID-19 um, initiative called uh, COVID-19 Center. Central uh, on HeroX. You go to HeroX.com slash COVID-19. Um, we're also working with the XPRIZE. Uh, we've joined their Pandemic Alliance, which is um, an initiative that they've formed working with uh, Anthem and many large companies on focusing on data, AI, and, and um, you know, bringing powerful tools to um, really help deal with this global pandemic. Um, Hero X with our COVID-19 central, what we're doing is we're providing um, pro bono use of our platform for uh, nonprofit COVID-19 related projects, as well as um, really supporting um, the, the various initiatives and innovations that are out there in the field, um, helping connect um, people and innovators with other innovators so that we can get network effects and synergies between organizations and um, bringing crowdsourcing and the power of the crowd to um, projects that are, are have a, 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 the opportunity to really make an impact with COVID-19. And, you know, that's covering the gambit from, you know, treatment options, um, you know, drug research, data analytics, um, using mobile apps to light up our economy, 
and help manage um, with case tracking and other, other elements. Um, there's some blockchain work that's being done. Um, so it's just really amazing response from the crowd on um, you know, bringing um, innovations and new ideas to all elements of this pandemic. And you know, we've talked a lot about them here. So um, if anybody wants to get involved um, or if you have a project that you're interested in, um, you can reach out to me um, and, uh, or go to the page. We're gonna be um, adding a um, application uh, form uh, later today and a, a volunteer form as well. So people can connect, can share what projects they're interested in. And we're gonna act as a matchmaker and, um, and a connector to help organizations um, get the support that they need. And um, again, people can use our platform um, to bring the power of the crowd to projects that they're they're working on, and and um, you know we really see this as an opportunity to to use the cognitive surplus that's out there to help uh, organizations solve problems. Um, and finally, a big theme here is is you know connecting you know back to the the machine platform crowd book, uh, which I highly recommend everybody reads. Um, you know they they um, the authors talk about the core plus crowd model of how you know, the, the winning strategy really is uh, a strong core, meaning an organization that's focused, has good leadership, leveraging crowdsourcing. And that uh, combination is extremely powerful. So that's one of the things we're really focusing on is helping connect uh, you know, corporate parties, um, government organizations with crowdsourcing, uh, crowdsourcing initiatives and open innovation projects. And uh, we're, you know, we're going to be running this for, well, you know, COVID-19 is going to, it's going to be a while f before um, we can really put that behind us. So, you know, we're really looking to help um, globally um, with the world deal with this pandemic. That's great, Christian. Thanks for adding that. I really appreciate it. Hey, hey John, you shot me a note um, on the, on the uh, feed too. And, you know, I know you in the San and Wazoku is doing some stuff in Europe. You might want to just add add some stuff. That'd be great. Sure. Just to to build off of what you uh, heard from our our good uh, uh, folks from HeroX, Inocent and Wazoku have made a concerted effort over the last two weeks and have challenges uh, that we've been approached on by uh, governments to help with. We're going to be doing some really interesting things for um, an Asian government that will. Uh, help in a lot of the things that they're doing to, to fight the COVID virus and um, offering to our clients the capability of, of uh, pro bono services for challenges specifically related to how they're dealing with COVID for their employees. The isolations, the psychological issues that are out there that you've heard about today that I know Christian and HeroX care about and others. These are things that we've gone to um, our clients and, and said, we want to help. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. Wazoku, our partner, has also offered for, uh, to provide their idea spotlight tool to our clients so that they have this employee connection uh, to one another to share what am I doing at home to still get a job done or how do I care for my kids plus balance my work life. There's lots of issues that are out there, but i um, happy to share with anyone here, we've seen an incredible increase in market traffic. There's tens of thousands of people that have already engaged on the challenges that we have up at Innocentive.com. So like Christian, um, we're, we're trying to offer this global crowd, the internet of prepared minds as we try to think about them, to offer their, their skills and abilities along with the AI capabilities that Wazoku has to um, once we get these answers, we're intending to bring them to the World Health Organization, NIH, CDC, other government organizations that can activate the private sector startups, accelerators to bring solutions to the marketplace. So thanks, John. And, uh, Great, John. And thanks. Any, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Balaji, you shot me a little note on the sidebar. I, I, it, it sounds like you've got some thoughts. No, I think, I mean, it's the, the, the conversation that at least happening on chat to say we've all been hoping for crowdsourcing and competitions to come into mainstream and be a dependable source of solutions. And I think uh, given the amount of activity that's happening, looks like it's, uh, it's getting there. I, I know many of us actually came um, together 
uh, make crowdsourcing more successful and crowdsourcing and, and creating the next billion dollar company with crowdsourcing and similar to how COVID could be, um, um, uh, could be a, I'm not gonna use the term, but the black swan event for open talent, uh, could it be the black swan event for making crowdsourcing and contests a mainstream dependable frequently used option? Uh, and I think it's the, John Healy's question goes back to being the most important question. What rules are being broken? What, what's, what's changing for that reality to come true? What were the barriers that, were keep, that was keeping both freelancing and competitive crowdsourcing limited in its, in its expansion? And were those, were those barriers, are those barriers being, being broken now in the context of being able to help in this, um, in this pandemic situation? I think that's a critical question to just reflect. Yeah, great. That's great. That's great, Balaji. Hey, Steve. You know, this is your first call, Steve Hatfield, and you know, you added a lot to the beginning. Any any reflections on what you've heard today, or any any thoughts before we wrap up? Um, so, I, I really enjoyed spending time with you. I really enjoyed the insights, um, and I really enjoyed the chat. Um, and so, many of the ideas um, that Dean and others were talking about, I, I really think are, uh, are things that will emerge. The the, the, the different talent pools, the refocusing on reimagining work, the different outcomes that we need to focus on, um, the, the ability to, to take that on in a way now is clearer in some ways as a result of what just happened. So that, that's great. That's great. Hey, um, so Jen from, from the lab, you know, Jen runs the Laboratory for Innovation Science at at Harvard and has been a you know partner and helps you know we do so much stuff together. Any reflections from you on on what you've heard and what you're working on or anything that you can add as a wrap? Yeah, we've got a, a a few things in a lot of these areas that's been discussed today. You know, on top of we have a very strategic relationship with the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT doing genetics research, so we're getting ready to release. Uh, uh, challenge on top coder uh, on COVID-19, again, data ideation and some computational stuff that we usually do. Excited about that. But sort of as, as Christian, you and John were talking, you know, I think one of the things, if you're thinking about sort of being the collector and the promoter of these things is to properly track metrics on which challenges are popping up when, um, how these are being carried through, what are the business successes and so on. There's tons of questions that I think we're not quite addressing yet. The crowdsourcing, I mean, we try to address um, some things in terms of, you know, disease spread and so on and, and uh, work environments, but uh, there's, there's ripples of implication. And so from a scientific perspective, I think we have a bunch of researchers. I'd love to take a look at this um, as we go. So happy to partner. We also have our own subset of challenges we've been collecting. Um, what I'm hearing is it's very difficult to, because there's so much in this space, um, having that right taxonomy and filtering mechanism, which is what I think you guys are working on, uh, that'd be helpful. And, and again, we've also joined XPRIZE Alliance as well. So hoping to uh, put a lot of minds together to, to solve some interesting things. Um, scientific community, certainly there's been great response. Um, a lot of um, gated, uh, non-open uh, access journals have just kind of thrown everything down and everything's free. So um, we're seeing lots and lots of scientific activity. So I think that's, that's great. Hopefully that's uh, a bit sustainable. And then um, things we didn't quite capture on, but um, we're, we've gotten quite into the AI and digital space, as you guys know, with relaunching the book earlier in the year and sort of, you know, what is, what is sort of the, uh, the effect on this on some of the planned AI activities and how that's either accelerating or decelerating, what's going on with operations and so on. So uh, a whole you know, list of things that, that we, we're gonna be addressing. Um, Chris talked about it earlier as well, Stanton, and uh, we're doing tons of research on gig economy. So uh, stay tuned. I mean, I think this is um, a good spot for us to be in and lots of interesting things. Um, if you have ideas, just shoot them over to me, uh, whether they're just ideas or we can flush them out into projects, you know, we'd love to, uh, hear from you guys. So uh, just shoot me a note and, um, you know, we'll, we'll keep chatting. All right. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for adding. Hey, also, John, John's yeah, got yeah. like the best hats. John's yeah. got the best hats in the world. <laughs> well, when you don't have, a, when you have as little hair as me, you've got to do something, right? <laughs> so you've got to make something interesting. So, well, hey, I think it's time to wrap this up. We're, we're about a minute late, but 
first of all, I really, really appreciate everybody taking the time out of their busy weeks. I think for all of us, right, we're on a lot more calls these days. And it's really hard, as Steve said earlier, you know, it's really hard to kind of segment, you know, what's work life, what's home life, how do we get it all done in a day? So, um, Steve, if you're still on, thanks a lot for being on the call um, and everybody else that contributed today. One of the things that I just wanted to mention and something I want to, you know, get get a little deeper in is, is Karen from HBS has been, she and I have been doing a bunch of, you know, notes back and forth and she's done, I've been writing some papers on the, on issues around mental health. Um, and I think that's something we should all think about a little bit. And I'd love for us to, you know, dive into that. You know, what does this mean for people when they're isolated and how do we connect with people and make sure that those folks that struggle with those kinds of issues, you know, we're, we're supporting them and making sure that everything moves in the right direction. So, so I guess a big thanks to everybody. Um, really appreciate you guys being on the call today. Such great input. Um, great to see so many faces. And one of the things I'd really encourage you, I'll shoot a note to everybody. Um, I love this idea of, you know, what rules need to be broken and what rules, you know, should be broken. And we, that, that's a possible subject for next week's call. But I'd love to get everybody actively involved in choosing the subjects from, for the calls each week. We can really dive into it and then and then also volunteering to talk about some of the things and the aspect of of the subject so i'll i'll actively ask you guys to send me notes on that and then let's um let's you know make sure that i'll get something out earlier in the week and we'll decide uh we'll decide what to do um lastly you know there's the chat has been super good this this week and so i'll make sure that we get a copy of the chat out to everybody so everybody has it with all the links and everything else but uh, anything that wasn't shared today, be sure to shoot me a note or shoot, shoot the team a note and I'll get to out, out to everybody as well. Thanks so much for taking the time today. And, and like I said, super grateful for all of your guys' efforts and time. And it's really, really fun to have this group pushing forward into that unknown together. Take care. Have you, Stay healthy. Stay healthy. Stay well. Stay healthy. Bye-bye.